Welcome to another Radio Friends again. Here it is, April 12th, 2024. We all got back together again. We never know who's going to stop by. That's what makes the show so um, wonderful and unpredictable. And uh, we like to get a few people into the room before we get started. So we'll go around the room so everybody can introduce themselves. Uh, for those of you who haven't tuned into the program before or just want to know who's uh, here today and uh, where they're coming to us from, different parts of the country. I'm Steve Parker, still down here in the Berlin uh, bunker or Berlin bunker uh, in Connecticut. It is rainy, it is nasty. But it's always sunshiny when I'm with you. Okay, uh, Bob Marks, how you doing this morning? Hey, good morning, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Coming from Vero Beach, Florida, home of the Vero Beach Film Festival. Paradise. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to the uh, film festival, the appearance by, by Joe Cipriano. Apparently, uh, Joe was going to swing by there, so I'm sure you guys will get together at some point. Uh, Tracy Carmen, uh, one of the other guys that's uh, one of our keepers of the flame. Uh, where are you coming to us from today, Tracy? I am from beautiful, <clears throat> rainy Longmeadow, Massachusetts. Uh, we're, uh, we're enjoying mm -hmm. spring weather, except for the rain. I'm not going to complain. And Bob Craig is here from uh, Pennsylvania. Bob, still? Yeah, we're still here in Philly. It's a monsoon rain right now and 60 degrees. So any of the outdoor vendors that have soft pretzels, they've now become sardine pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> and Debo is here. Dave Overson. Hi, Dave. Hello. Hello. I'm coming from uh, sunny, you know, just terrible, sunny, warm Florida in uh, Port St. Lucie area. And I'm just about a few minutes from where Bob Marks is right now. So... And enjoying the blood weather. And Pete Salant is back. Hi, Pete. And I am a half block from the beach, Steve, on the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia Beach, where we had a tornado warning at 1245 this morning. Scared the you-know-what mm -hmm. out of us uh, when the that warning sound came on my phone. My wife has it turned off, and I should have it turned off, too. But then we wouldn't have known there was a Chesapeake, a, there was a, a, a warning, and we should get in the closet, which we did. Uh, Finally came out of the closet, huh? Yeah, you know, yeah. Somebody, somebody <laughs> just, it was a race to the punchline on that one. Very nice work, Dave. Uh, okay, uh, Jim, everything. good morning, Jim. Uh, actually, I'm Ronaldo Funman. I'm the janitor here, and I'm uh, just watching <laughs> this place for the guy. Um, <laughs> but he's in beautiful, sunny Bethel Park, Pennsylvania, which is uh, known today for area flood warnings and wind advisories. So life is good. And there's the judge, Judge Harrigan's back. Hi, Judge. Oh, you're muted. Your microphone is muted, Hal. The Marcel Marceau edition. Ah, yeah, that, I, I, I thought I clicked on that. Thing. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm coming to you live and in person from Studio 20 here in uh, rainy and windy Marlboro, Connecticut. All right, I think we got uh, every. Buddy, did no, I? Oh, John Landry. Oh, John Landry. Oh, wait a minute. I lost John. Oh, there he is. He popped back up. Hi, John. What do you mean you lost me? I've been here all along. No, um, my, my, the way my the way my setup on my screen goes, it messes me up. Oh, well. Anyway, I'm coming to you from uh, Middletown, Connecticut, and it's soggy and rainy and yucky out. But there's a rainbow coming up pretty soon. So ah, uh, yes, and there's love in your heart. Okay. Um. All right, so we had the big news yesterday. One of our uh, great athletes, uh, O.J. Simpson, uh, finally found the murderer of uh, his uh, wife and her boyfriend. So um, because he went to the great beyond, uh, how did everybody take the loss of O.J. and uh, <laughs> all the uh, all the cheering? But what was it like? Uh, what do you remember from when, uh, when O.J. Uh, did the slow motion uh, Bronco chase? Well, I know I was with my mother at uh, Middlesex Hospital and. Uh... We, uh, I got a TV for, and we were watching the, uh, the chase on TV and she was, she could have cared less about OJ Simpson. That's for sure. How the guy uh, got acquitted. Uh, I'll never know. Remember if the glove don't fit, you got to acquit. Okay. Yeah. But Pete, hmm. he didn't, he really didn't get away with it because he's now to a higher judge. That, yeah, that that is true. That's true. Oh. Well, I, I'm looking the wrong way. Sorry. The other judge. <laughs> the other judge. Not the one. Not the one on our screen. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so somebody said that he was also in the Towering Inferno. I said, yes, he probably is right now, too. <laughs> Dante's. That would be Dante's Inferno. Mm. Correct. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a funny meme online where they take the uh, white Bronco that he was driving, make it look like a hearse, and have police cars follow, following it. <laughs> oh, I thought that was great. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember Dave. We were, um, we were when we were doing the show at POP. I think we pulled in uh, Nicole's sister or something that we did an interview with. Yes, too. we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, that was amazing. How how we got that? Uh, how we got her on there? I don't know. That was amazing. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because they were saying yesterday. One of the guys I was listening to on the radio said he's surprised that as the years rolled on. Um, you know, kind of, you know, OJ went on, he did a podcast, you know, I don't know, what was it called? What if I did? I don't know what it was. What he, he wrote, To write a book, what if I did? It was amazing when he did that. But, um, you know, I, I have to admit, though, that no one had spoken to him for a while. And the uh, particular talk show host that I was uh, listening to on the air said something about, you know, he was surprised that maybe even I didn't, I, did anybody know about the diagnosis? I mean, um, you know, did anybody care? You know, I was going to well, say, did I, anybody care? Yeah, uh, having had prostate cancer myself, you know, you can, um, you know, there's no reason why someone has to die from prostate cancer because there's today there's so many treatments you can do, and I think he just didn't uh, didn't care about it, didn't think he was, he thought he was invincible and just let it go. I mean, Merv Griffin was the same way; he died of prostate cancer, and and he just denied it that he had it, and then. You know, before it was too late, you know, he was gone. So, yeah, it just, uh, just to me, that was, but again, that's one of those things that, you know, it takes over the whole, even when, you know, even when he, you know, he passed away, all of a sudden he was on the top of the news again. But, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite a scene. And of course, you know, Pete, Pete uh, said he didn't know how OJ got away with it, but it was one juror out of 12, I think, that had a reasonable doubt. But if you look at all of the facts that were brought into the case, there's no way he should have gotten away with this. No. I mean, the blood led right into his his car and it was on his clothing. And, and plus, he was running away in the Bronco. Let's remember how the whole thing started. If he hadn't have done it, he wouldn't be out there trying to escape. And didn't he have a gun in the back of the Bronco, too? Yes, yeah, to his head and all that. Yes. Yeah. Well, it saved a lot of money if he'd taken the gun. He had the kill. He had the killer at gunpoint. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in February, uh, he was seen coming out of his apartment complex or wherever condo complex, and uh, he said this: "Hey, X World, hospice, hospice. You talking about hospice? <laughs> no, I, I'm not in any hospice. I don't know who put that out there, but." Whoever put that out there, I guess it's like the Donald say, can't trust the media. Uh, in any event, I'm hosting a ton of friends for, for the Super Bowl here in Las Vegas. All is well, <laughs> you know. So, hey, guys, take care. Have a good Super Bowl weekend. That's what, two months ago? Two months yeah. ago, he was laughing at it. Hospice, yeah. hospice. He was going to have a Super Bowl weekend. And uh, well, he, he was, was definitely in, in denial, huh? Yes, oh, thank yeah. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely, because uh, prostate cancer is curable. I mean, you can do it with radiation, you can do it with the seeds, and you can do it with a prostatectomy, having it removed like I did. Um, you know, and and even the cancer came back for me, and I went through seven weeks of radiation, and my PSA level has been down to zero since for almost two years, and and this October I will be. Uh, I will be done with that procedure. Dave, uh, when you get blood work done, you you should always have the PSA test, right? Because oh yeah, it's it's done. It's done monthly. It's done by my oncologist, and he's you know I meet with him once a month, and he says good news. He says non detectable. Let's keep it that way, and and it's been that way for nearly a, a good year, more than a year and a half. So, yeah, I know when I when I went to my doctor for my physical. You know, he, he, he's been the family doctor. He's my dad's doctor. He's a great, he's a great guy. And we started uh, shooting the breeze. And, and after I left, I said, he didn't check my prostate. And I said, well, you know, maybe we were talking too much and all this kind of stuff. So finally, it's just I, like the finger. 
Well, no, what happened? So what happened was I went back to him at some point. He goes, he goes, yeah, I know you thought I forgot, right? And I said, that's my favorite part. You know, I just always bring flowers, you know. <laughs> no but, dinner, uh, no flowers, you know. Right. So I um so he said, No, we do it through the blood work and everything. I said, Okay. I said, you know, yeah. Um, but that I will say, I said, Boy. I'm a glutton for punishment if I'm going to ask him if he forgot this. But then I know my doctor's not. If he did forget it, I would have thought, uh-oh, something's wrong. Hey, Dave Nagel signing in. Good morning, Dave. How are you feeling today? Doing okay. Doing okay, Steve. Been uh, been a little crazy in our world. Marlene's still in the hospital after uh, spinal cord surgery a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Ooh, and, uh, sorry to hear that. Oh, so, yeah, thanks. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're teaching her to walk again and... Uh, uh, hopefully she'll get the use of her arms and hands back, uh, especially the left one because she's left-handed. What uh, happened, Dave? If you don't mind me asking, where, where, where did this come from? It came from it. It actually started a few months ago. Uh, one of the dogs, she tried to take a dog out for a walk. Dog pulled her. She fell down. Thought she hurt her shoulder. Then she noticed she had some tingling in her arm and said, "That's eh, just you know, you know, it's probably just a sprain or something. Let it go. Let it go." And she started noticing because she was painting a lot <clears throat> that. Her ability to, to to paint was diminished. Her ability to write started to diminish. Her gait started to diminish. So uh, we reached out to the primary care physician, and uh, she said, "Well, okay, we'll start at the beginning. They they did a uh, an MRI of the brain to rule out MS first, because uh, that was the, the first suspect. And then uh, they did an MRI of the, of the neck, and uh, uh, the primary care said Do you, uh, the comment she made was, "Do you want to use Dave's surgeon?" Oh wow! Because <laughs> because uh, uh, my spinal surgeon was done seven years ago, so yeah, we use the same guy. So uh, you guys sure have had some health problems. Yeah, so we have, we have, but uh, but hey, we're doing okay. I mean, you know, uh, hopefully she'll recover okay. I'm hey, I'm up and on the right side of the dirt and walking every day, so I'm pretty happy about that. And, you yeah. know, but uh, but you know, thanks for uh, thanks thanks, Bob. I I appreciate the uh, the the kind thoughts that. Uh, and uh, prayers. So, um, you know, definitely. you guys, um, you guys are, you know, everybody. I mean, you um, back with Paul and God, God rest his soul with Paul Payton. And, you know, yeah. one, of the, one of the things about whether it's this particular group or sometimes on Facebook or whatever, it takes a lot to share these things when it's so personal. Yeah. But in a yeah. way, it's it's nice to know that you've got that, you know, first of all, you're comfortable enough to talk about it. So we all have our antenna up. But also the fact that, you know, it's uh, it's great that you feel comfortable enough, um, whether it's your friends on Facebook or or your friends here, to be able to share that. So, uh, but God bless you. And yeah, we do send uh, send prayers out your way. It's, like, it's, it's gotten to the point, Dave, when, you know, I see something on there and maybe you're at the hospital for special care, or whatever's going on. I have to look closely to see who's giving us the update on who. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. well, she's inpatient. I'm outpatient there now. So, so. Yeah, and and she came to to you in such a special uh, time of your life and really pulled your butt uh, back, uh, got you back into the land of the living too. After after you lost Ryan, right? Yeah, yeah. That's we kind of met over that. She heard me uh, talking about him on the air one day, and she was a listener at JMJ, mm -hmm. and uh, she reached out to me and. Uh, she used to, I, I knew her as a, one of the contestants when we would play games on the air. It's Marlene from Plainville for you now a few years. Oh. Um, and uh, she reached out after Ryan passed and, uh, and uh, she had uh, carried a baby almost full term and lost the baby. So uh, she kind of, our, our kids kind of brought us together is mm -hmm. the way we describe it because mm -hmm. she gets the pain. Um, yeah. She, she was a gift in my life when I, uh, when I was at a low point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, It's strange. Same thing happened with me and, and Angela, you know, the fact that I was just about, well, you know, I had, I had tried everything. It had been about five years since I lost Kelly and I tried. Oh my God. Match.com is a humbling experience when you realize you can have 1100 rejections and you go, look on the bright side, Steve, right? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I had to comb down my search a little bit more when I got 1100 rejections. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they must have heard your show, Steve. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's, uh, it, you know, it's what, what somebody said. Um, I was taking a class in New York at one time, and it was a an acting class, and the guy that was running the class really nailed it. And he said, when you have your partner that way, you're free to be a child. And that's that's so powerful that you can go back to being a child like that 
but also that's somebody who knows a side of you that nobody else does. And I know um, even with Angela, when we reconnected and as much as she'd stayed in touch with the family and my dad and everything, um, my dad and her, you know, continued to go out for years. I mean, they, they, went, <laughs> they went grocery shopping. They did, you know, she was always, and I say that she waited for me to turn into him before she decided to date me again. But, you wow. know, again, you know, that, that's somebody. And uh, and uh, I, I see Bob is muted. I don't know why Bob is muted. I hope I didn't say something to offend him. Bob, you're muted. Bob. Unless you wanted to hear me coughing. Did you okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, I've been getting over some kind of a sinus infection. It's been with me almost two weeks now. It's really been just hanging in and... Uh, you know, struggling to get be on the air here and there when I had, I've just lost my voice totally. Uh, when I got off the air last Sunday, fortunately it came back the next day somewhat, but, uh, you know, you do, you do realize, you know, to be, I think the hardest thing with the, with all the stuff I went through Kelly with, um, the hardest thing, especially in front of, um, your, uh, your wife or your better half or whatever is to be a realistic cheerleader is what I call it. You know, you have to try to be as, as positive as you can and keep that person, you know, tuned into you versus being, you know, Hey, I would walk out of her room sometimes and I would practically collapse and say, how the hell is she doing this? When you mm -hmm. be in there saying, you know, you got to get up, you got to get going, you know, and God bless them. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable. But uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, everybody else doing okay. Uh, Judge, you doing all right. Yeah, I've got my I've got my cure right here. <laughs> oh my um, God! Look yeah. at her. This is my solution <laughs> to all my problems. Who's that, Judge? Move over this, move over this way. Yep. Can you see her? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. She's a cutie. Beauty. Best therapy in the world, man. Best yeah. therapy in the world. Holy Toledo! I know. Where's her mustache? <laughs> <laughs> whenever she drinks milk she has to show me that it does she has a mustache too right how about uh, john landry how about you everything okay with you i saw you the other night at our uh boobs get together well i'm on this side of the grass so i guess i'm doing all right yeah. and uh, you know but, yeah it's interesting that you guys are talking about all of this stuff we're all getting to that age but uh i still think that it's because of COVID, a lot of these problems have surfaced. Uh, reactions to the vaccination and whatnot. I mean, there's strange things that I've been talking to people that it's happened to them health-wise that, you know, apparently they were perfectly okay, got the shot. Six months later, you know, a year later, got all these weird symptoms, you know, then there's no cause for it. Can I put things in perspective for a second? Since I do insurance, uh, if you're underwriting for life insurance and you didn't have the COVID shot, you can get super preferred. That the ratings or the rates are really great. If you had two shots, it goes down a notch. If you had uh, three shots, you get standard. So if the insurance companies know something's funky going on with the shots, uh, whether the government's admitting it or not, you know it's out there. That's fascinating, Tracy. Wow. Yeah, that is fascinating. Yeah. It's food for that thought. Should make, that, uh, that, that should make the newspapers, I think. That should gotcha. definitely. I'd be somebody. I'd be. I'd be actually be interested in. Uh, you know, if you know someone specific, that's something I. I wouldn't mind talking about uh, on TIC. You know, I mean, uh, I. It's, I it's, uh, the, the the stuff is out there. Google the articles. It's out there. It's not. It's not that hidden. It's just that people aren't paying attention. Uh, more well, than anything. All right. I love all of you, but I think we're going down the tubes here. Um, you know, so uh, I, I <laughs> You've been down the tubes a long time ago. We're all going to have different opinions. Did, did, did we ever did we ever talk, Steve, about um, what we would have done if we hadn't gone into radio? Well, that, yeah, Pete, you're on the same wavelength as <laughs> really? me. Really? Always <laughs> been thinking about that. I would have been a vi virologist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I think. I, when you got your first job, I mean, uh, were, you, were you like I was for some bizarre reason? I mean, I took the maintenance job and made some good money. I cleaned, you know, my dad was the one after the first night said, do a job you can't stand and you'll appreciate it afterwards. But I always knew somehow that and I always stayed connected with radio through my dad. And I always knew that somehow I'd, I'd end up <laughs> in the business. So every time I had to do a, a crappy job, literally, 
I knew that there'd be, you know, great shtick. <laughs> and I remember when I talked, I, we interviewed Joey when I was doing the POP show and he was doing overnights on, on POP then on the network. And um, he said, Steve, I always knew you would do this. You just had to get the texture. And that's the way I looked at everything. You know, I never felt like I'd be, you know, stuck somewhere. And, uh, you know, even now, I think, you know, keeping it, even if I always tell guys that even if you're not getting paid for it anymore, it's staying connected to it. But but when you look back, I mean, Pete, what would you have been? I mean, well, actually, you know, you look at your 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 legit now. You know, you became, <laughs> you know, here you are, a clinical uh, so psychologist or a clinical social worker, so, right, that, I mean, which is just like a psychologist, except right. without the PhD. I, I've never done anything else other than radio uh, until I until Clear Channel kicked me out of radio, and that was that. And I had to had to do something, so I had to finish college and go go to grad school and do this it was the obvious thing because i had been um you know crazy djs coming in saying hey i didn't you know didn't get any from my my girlfriend last night and all oh, right it's okay you know i was always the guy who, who would pat him on the back or it rained during my entire uh my entire vacation all right take another week it's okay i would i mean i would do that so this was an obvious thing but the only other thing i could ever have done is become a concert pianist uh i started playing piano when I was three and right even today although I don't play as often um you name a song that the, a popular song that came out since 1964 or something and I can play a, f a fully orchestrated version of it on the piano in in 2001 I came out with a, a, a instead of a Christmas card um, I did a CD of nine Christmas songs that I orchestrated on electronic music, MIDI, uh, and I played all the instruments. I mean, it, they're entirely orchestrated with, uh, and like my version of um, uh, uh, Sleigh Ride sounds exactly like the uh, original. And I call, I decided to call the album, um, a Jewish guy plays Christmas songs <laughs> and, it, and it's, and, and it's me with a, with a yarmulke and a prayer shawl sitting in front of the, of the piano. And, 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 you know what? Um, uh, uh, Floyd Wright, God bless his soul, yeah. used to play it on the air on YZ, uh, <gasps> He used to play cuts from it all the time, uh, so it got it got some exposure. But I, it's you know I still put cuts from it on on Facebook or you know around every holiday time. I love to hear that. I love to you hear also that. know. I mean, Pete, you must know. A lot of you guys must know. And it was that way with my dad. If you're a program director, you better be a damn good psychologist if you're dealing with you know all of the guys and all the issues and whether the that's the point. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And and their spouses or significant others, correct? Because they they would come in too and bitch and you know have issues. <laughs> well, well, you know, Dave, you you know when you give so much to your job and to your to the radio station, sometimes there isn't that much left over, and you got to make sure you do pay attention to your spouse or your you know whatever. So oh yeah, no, I wasn't thinking of my spouse. I was thinking of the spouses of the the, the guys who you know you you're already. Uh, consoling in your office, their spouses yeah. would come in sometimes too, and it's like, oh, well, you really? Know, we we really need this time for vacation. We really, it's like, whatever it was. You know? it's like, yeah, it's yeah. like you know, here, here's Jim Harrington. The guy's a frustrated actor, and all he wants to do is go out there and swim with sharks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, I, I got a. I actually had a advertising business for nine years here in Pittsburgh, almost ten years, and I ended up producing and directing TV commercials. I, I got a bunch of telly awards. I mean, they, it's kind of in broadcasting, but it was television, you know. And and of all things, I sat behind the camera, you know, directing these things. I that that's where I probably would have gone if I didn't wow. get into radio, you know. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think that probably that would have that was where it really was my my saving grace and where you do believe in divine intervention. I mean, when I. When I didn't, you know, when I always wanted to explore television, you know, being a kid growing up in front of the box and, you know, I, I didn't have the pipes. That was my big thing back then. You know, most of you guys had pipes and I didn't have them. And I, I actually, you know, left the business when I was 30 and, you know, went to New York and, uh, you know, realized how blessed I was to have what I had back here. And, you know, realized that, you know, you can make a living as a, 
as an actor and nobody ever has to know who you are. You know, you can make enough, you know, make a good wage by doing industrials and stuff. But I will say though, when I came back and within weeks, somebody said to me, Hey, this, this company betting barn across the street from the radio station, I was looking for somebody to do their television commercials who can do it. Who's never been on television. So if that ain't some sort of a divine intervention, you know, so I got to feed that television beast, but it really, really, really made me appreciate radio more than ever. But a lot of you guys that have been on the air for all these years, you have to be, you know, for in many cases, for many cases for your listeners, you're you're being psychologists without even knowing it. Wow. Well, sure, you are you are uh, trying to uh, create a behavior where people will come back and listen to you again and again and again because they just can't resist you. So that's manipulation yeah. of human behavior. That's psychology. That's I mean, true. That. I mean, how many times do you do a show when you're feeling lousy? You know, you're feeling sick. Oh, you know, dude. you're running to the restroom between every song. But when you come back, you got to be special on the air. You're right. I've always found that to be a very good cure for any ills that you have. I'm sure all of us got up, said, Jesus, how the hell am I going to pull this show off today? You get in there, you flip the mic on, and it's an elixir. It just, you know. There and then somebody the will say, somebody will say, Bob, boy, I heard you today. It was the best show you ever did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As opposed to doing what you thought was the best show you've ever done. And somebody else says, you know, were you sick this morning? It just didn't sound right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I know it's uh, I, what I found after I, you know, I, you know, again, I just, you know, my few hours on Saturday morning, but I found that um, that would always give me a lift. And when when I really wasn't, they weren't going to give me an ISDN line, and I was out of the house. We didn't have a we had we finally found a good system to be able to get back on the air. But um, every Saturday morning, by myself at the house, I would take my iPhone, I'd put it on my windowsill in front of my sink, and for just a few friends that I would I knew would be out there, I'd say, "Well, you know, still back at the sink, hoping to get back into the radio station at some point in time." But I I found that. That gave me a lift because primarily the cool thing about if you're doing Facebook while you're on the air, if one person says good morning, you realize you really do have one listener at that point in time. And <laughs> it also starts another memory and another conversation like we do here. Yeah, yeah. one of the uh, I had a I got a strange, strange situation uh, if I hadn't gotten into radio. I was looking to uh, get into mortuary science and uh, really, and I, I, I really was, this was a step up from that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know, I think and, to get in there. Yeah, absolutely. Last one to put you under, but I mean, uh, it, career is a dead end. Dave. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and I, I originally thought about it. Uh, then I decided, nah, this isn't for me. My second line of work was police work, but I, I was too short. And of course, back then you had to have a height requirement and all that. And so that's how I got into the auxiliaries because there was no height requirement. Then I got the job at DRC. And, and when the, the uh, chief of police uh, asked me twice, he says, he says, why don't you take the test for the department? He says, we can use a good guy like you. And I says, I, I, says, I, I enjoy doing what I'm doing. And I'm glad I stayed the route I did. Because from there, then I went into television and the rest is history. But uh, but mortuary science was my uh, my 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 first choice. Why got to work with first... a lot of stiffs? What's that? <laughs> you got to work with a lot of stiffs. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it good one, I just, Lee. Good one. I I just I couldn't. You know, it's funny. Yeah, you know, I remember seeing my first dead body at the morgue, and uh, and I says, uh, I says, I don't know if I want to do this. So I'll get into police work, and what am I doing? Dead bodies at the morgue because we had a homicide, and we had to go shoot uh, stills of it. And I was shooting stills; I was shooting video and uh, black and white video back then. And uh, I says, "Well, here I am, back in the morgue again." But um, no, I'm, I'm I'm glad I did the route I did. I took. Why did you ever want to do that in the first place, Dave? What happened to you in your life to say, "Boy, I can't wait to do this." Uh, when my grandfather passed away, the funeral director came over to my grandmother's house and I was there and his compassion is service and what he was giving service to, to my grandmother and, and that, and I just like the way they, you know, you're, it's a service business. You're, 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 you're making, 
uh, someone's life better at a difficult time in their life. And that I like doing. That's the part I saw. And but then the clinical part, I did I couldn't couldn't take that at that point in my life. I was too young, I think. And uh, then when I got into police work, and then I remember going to the to the morgue for homicides that we had in town or death in town, and you go in and you know I was a lot older then I could take it, but uh, no, I just I got I found my true love was broadcasting. True love was was broadcasting for me that's what i and did. the other way you would always been stuck with the graveyard shift absolutely <laughs> and i was i was <laughs> I, you could just keep going and going going and going i'm done know? that's all there is yeah <laughs> was, uh, one, of the, one of the great things about about radio was the fact that or performing arts in general i mean if you want to use performing arts very loosely when you talk about radio there's really no admission requirements. Any schmuck can wind up on the radio doing whatever. And if you're like me, you have absolutely no uh, uh, ambition to further your education. It was just something you knew you wanted to do. And you just went with it because it was so appealing at that time. I mean, it was just wide open. And, and you could perform and you could do whatever. And, you know, thankfully, it, it really worked out very, very well for me. And still added to this very day. So it was, uh, you know, a unique calling. Thank you, Dick Robinson. Can you imagine if we hadn't had Dick uh, and, you know, opening up uh, his school and how many people went through there and realized that it was, you know, that uh, above average ambition and at least somebody, I used to go to job fairs and you could see the lost souls in there. And in many cases, you'd say, you know, TV, radio, and they would say that because, you know, that that's something. I remember one time at DRC, um, Paul Roberts, I mean, he was, after my dad was in the hospital, I remember Paul there and he was, he had a clipboard and he's listening to auditions and he's grading all these different quality of resume, which is what I really need if a guy's going on the air. But um, he said, put on a tape. If the guy's got something, bring him yeah. in. You know, that's, that's, and it's the same thing even in the world of sales. I don't give a shit if you have a marketing degree or not. If you can go out and hit your number every month and I'm a sales manager, you know, these are areas where you either, can do it or or you can't do it. But how many times you see really famous people, you know, famous comedians and stuff that say, if this hadn't come along, I don't know what I would have ever done. You know, and it's, uh, you know, I think I always tell people that many in like my world, I've always seen, you know, I'm, I'm working three different jobs now and I've always had to work multiple jobs. And um, I, I would always say, as long as you stay connected with the passion, you know, many cases, all I did was read to the blind one hour of the week. And everybody said, it would be, I've been doing it 45 years. Why? There's a microphone for an hour every week. And I'll kill anybody who wants to take it out of my hands. So, you know, stay connected with it. You know, I say that to so many guys who say that, you know, well, I'm not in it anymore. Well, go read at your church. You know, I always, it's corny, but I always say, you know, God gave you an instrument. Just go out and play it. You know, my dad, yeah. that's my, my dad only, only had that one job his whole life. And then after, it was great to see people like, you know, um, uh, guys over at HCN, you know, Dan Hayden and, uh, you know, guys up at, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Jack up at uh, Jack Casey up in Boston, you know, guys that saw, hey, Charlie Parker, he does that. Let's bring him in. But up until mm -hmm. that point, you know, but he was a guy who seriously did start the business by talking into a lamp, into a light bulb when he was a kid. <laughs> And he always joked about the fact that once he got up to 100 watts, he was ready to go on the air. And <laughs> I did have a woman when I was on the air at POP that sent me a note and she's a little little pink slip and said, you know, um, I called her up and she said, I used to live with your father. And she said, um, your, you know, your father uh, loved radio so much. And he was boarding there because his mom had passed away and he wanted to finish high school in, in Wethersfield. And uh, she said he'd come home with the newspaper every night and have the dinner with the family and go upstairs. And I said, and he read the news into the light bulb like it was a microphone. How'd you know that? And I said, because you just confirmed it, you know. But, you know, that was a guy that, you know, he never thought he didn't even know if he'd be in radio. He was a radio man in the Navy. He got um, honorably discharged shortly after because they found out right out of basic that he had a sway back. So he was in his World War II and he didn't wasn't going to be able to go. And um, he applied for a job at a tobacco store. And was, after he applied for the job, he wanted to see DRC. Radio man, they hired him on the spot. But that's, you know, that's the rare thing. 
and also as the opportunities came up throughout his career at DRC, he never, you know, never wanted to upset the home life with my sister. And well, I. that's just it. I was going to say your father was the exception because he kind of stayed in Hartford for his whole career. One yeah. of the things that you got to do for the most part in our business is be willing to pack well, up your life yep. and move to another place. And, and that got to, for me personally, uh, we got to Pittsburgh and my wife said, this is it. I hope you like Pittsburgh because uh, we're not moving anymore. Uh, and she, she was right because the kids ended up growing up and having friends and, you know, they went to Penn state and stayed in the same area and, and, and life was good for him, but uh, it's a tough business. You've got to be able to go, you know, I mean, in my, in my career, I worked in Providence, Hartford, Boston, uh, New York, uh, Albany, Pittsburgh. And then that, that was it. And we put the brakes on a little bit in Rochester too, you know, uh, speaking of the Egypt, gypsy life, so to speak in, in radio, I was, um, watching a profile of the, it actually was the 100th anniversary of WBT in Charlotte, North Carolina. And they had produced something for their 90th year. So they went on the air in 22, I guess it was. And they were rattling off and showing videos and, and they were showing footage of right from the beginning, WBT, a legendary station in that market. And when we were getting into the 80s, the 1980s, I totally forgot about this. But Pete Sullivan worked there. They mentioned his name. Oh. Pete was there wow. not too long. Uh, and I remember him. I think he was either there after. He had to be, it had to be before he came to Philadelphia. But I totally forgot about him. There was a guy who was really, really good. I mean, he was just the oh, most. Yeah. And for, unfortunately, he got some bad breaks. And I, I think I've mentioned to you uh, one or two times, um, you talk about moving around. I wound up calling him the gypsy because, God, you never know where the hell he was going to wind up. He was in L.A. He was, I mean, all over the place and just never really got never really got the right shot that would promote what he was all about. He was a, a very, very big fan growing up of WNAW AM in New York City. He just mm -hmm. idolized that radio station. And uh, that was, basically you know, Bob, his roots. what you said is interesting because sometimes you get to a fork in the road and you take the wrong path. Yep. And, you know, if he'd gone the other way, uh, the guy would have ended up in New York or Chicago or someplace. It's not always the most talented or the most gifted that end up in the big major markets successful. Sometimes it's just the lucky. Yeah, it's the right place at the right time. That's yep. all it is. That's the whole thing comes down to. Or you could take Yogi Berra's advice about the fork of the road. Yeah. Did he come to the fork in the road? Take, take it. it. Take, it. <laughs> take the fork, yeah. Uh, that, that gypsy lifestyle thing cost me uh, a job for a couple of years because when uh, when P.O.P. switched from uh, from uh, music to all news, uh, I had, at the time that I was there as a jock, I'd been working a lot with Lance Drake, the production director. And when when the when my DJ job was eliminated, uh, as it happens, the production the production director, uh, Dick Fox, uh, who had succeeded Lance, was leaving to go, I think, to go to Charlotte. And um, I pitched him on making me the production director. But uh, Dick Springfield and Al Pellegrino were convinced that because, you know, I was a disc jockey, I, as, as soon as the next disc jockey job came along in some other city, that I would fly the, fly the coop and they'd be looking for another production director. So they made uh, they made uh, TJ the production director instead and did not give me the job. And then two and a half years later, when 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 uh, TJ switched over to sales, uh and I was still in the market working at an ad agency. They said, well, I guess he's not, he's not going for the next DJ job in the next town. And, uh, and they called me up and said, uh, you want that job? And I took it and stayed there for the next 18 years. Wow. That is a, uh, it, it really is amazing. And it's like, you know, it always goes back to W O L D. It always goes back to the <laughs> Harry Chapin song and it's so real. And I remember, 
Robinson one time when I was filling in for a little while up at Wellesley Hills. And he said, you know, he walked into the room and said, okay, how many of you are ready, are, are ready to relocate? And you see three hands go up and go, okay, those are the guys that are going to be the players. You know I mean? You know, that's, that's, you got to embrace that. I found out one of the, one of the, one of the greatest things is you, once you leave, you put a value on a family like you've never had before. I, I did that, you know, when I went to New York, I said, wow, what a blessing I have to have so many people to care, you know, it makes you, uh, makes you look at that and just, oof. but yeah, I'm still trying to decide what I'm going to do. Someday I'll go back to school and find out what the hell I was supposed to do in all these years. When I, when I did an audition at WNHC, it was working, uh, Bill Hennis was the, uh, the, uh, PD then. And I remember Bill telling me, he says, he says, you got potential. He says, but you know, you work in your, your Waterbury and Sonia market, and then you get to New Haven. And then from New Haven, you get to Hartford. And so I never worked in New Haven. I wanted to work in New Haven all my life. I'd never worked at Waze and I wanted to work at NHC. Nothing. I couldn't, there was nothing for me there. And so I wound up in Hartford and I remember running with into Bill many years later. And uh, yeah, I t introduced myself to him, told him who I was and that he remembered. And then he says, where are you working? I says, I'm working at WDRC in Hartford. He goes, wow. He says, uh, did you work in New Haven? I said, no, <laughs> never. No. no, I just totally skipped New Haven and went right to Hartford. And uh, I was very fortunate. I was blessed. I was blessed. I was blessed the fact that I worked with your dad. I was blessed when I went over and did six months at TIC, uh, which was a great education for me there. And then coming back to DRC to work full time. And then that opened up the door for ESPN as well. So, And of course, we a lot of you guys were blessed because, you know, being at a station like that and being between Boston and New York. I mean, that was a, a we I remember people going through uh, listening to TIC. Somebody got. Uh, uh, I don't know if it was Angela Dias or somebody got, you know, hired right out of uh, Hartford to go to New York or something. You know, it was kind of like how records broke in Hartford, you know, be that, that close to two major markets. That helps a lot. I can't tell you how blessed I was to have Dave and John Landry as my board op. I mean, that was the highlight of my my career. Bob, would you repeat that again? I want to hear that. <laughs> how do you want the truth? <laughs> Yeah. I was so like you were. Listen, I was like David. Uh, radio is not my first choice of uh, career, but uh, when I got out of school, uh, all of the jobs at the slaughterhouse were were. were <laughs> I had no other choice. <laughs> Ser seriously, uh, Judge Hal, um, what what drew you to IT after you got out of radio? Uh, well, you, you know, I, I have said this before, when I was working with you and uh, at Waves, uh, things weren't going that well because of uh, Mr. Patrick. And uh, oh, yeah. I, I knew my, my, my days at Waves were not, uh, were, were, they were numbered. But uh, I, I happened to go to a, a, a family gathering early that, uh, early that spring. And uh, my, uh, my brother-in-law was... Uh, going to CPI, Computer Processing Institute, and he was, he was working on a program that day while everybody else was, uh, was, was eating and having fun. And he showed me the, uh, the work he was doing. And I'm looking at it, it's a COBOL program. I don't know if anybody's yeah what COBOL is, but I'm looking at it and he's showing me it. And, I, and I understood what he was saying. I said, oh, gee, this is pretty good. And he, and he told me, he says, they're, they're looking for people. This is a wide open industry. Uh, yeah, it's good money to start. And I said, I, I think that's what I'm going to do. And that's when I came to you, Pete. You, you are responsible for, for my big change in career, too, because uh, I came to Pete and I knew I wanted to go to this place called CPI, but it would take six months. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do for income for the six months I have to go to there, uh, go to that school? And uh, I went to Pete and I said, look, is there any way you can arrange that uh, I'm leaving here, but you guys are, are laying me off so I can collect some uh, some unemployment insurance? And Pete said, well, let me let me let me talk to the, uh, the big wigs. And uh, it came back. Yeah, they said, OK, so Pete, thank you very much for a, a great career change. Well, it was uh, you were you were a, a, a big loss, but life goes on and. That that's how it works, and I, 
the guy who made it very difficult for us, the ops manager, I had him blown out not long after. So because he, <laughs> he was he was trading out carpeting and stuff for his home. And oh. I went I went right to the owners and, uh, you know, uh, I, I said, this this isn't what you want, is it? And he was fired. The guy was fired that morning. So. Wow. And I got his job. And that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't my point. But that that happened. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but and if to think back when uh, Joe Cipriano was um, with us, you know, a few weeks ago, and he and he made that mention. He said how when he wrote down in his yearbook WDRC plus, and um, you know, he wanted to get there. And seventeen years old, and shortly thereafter, what did he go to New York or Philly, or where did he go from there? Um, he he Look went he he went to D he yeah he went to DC after that. You know, that's that's having his his eye on it. But, you know, again, it, it's it's where you you know, it's it's where you want to be and, uh, you know, and reach him for the stars. You know, now, Dave, I, Dave Nagel, I know you were at ICH, though. What did you want to do before you got into radio? I since I was about 14, wanted to get into radio. I had my a, a, a homebrew studio in my parents basement. I had speakers mm -hmm. out to the backyard. Uh, I actually ran microphones, so I would actually be able to record outdoor sounds from from there and stuff. It was uh, it, it was a passion for me ever since I was a kid. So uh, I was uh, lucky enough to to end up working in my hometown for for years uh, at uh, WCTY and WICH before I came to Hartford and DRC. And you were instrumental in that, Steve. Uh, I, I, I I do remember. Uh, basically, you know, uh, you saying that you used to listen to me on the way to my squam like that. Yeah, like well, down, down at, um, down at, uh, and Strawberry Fields or Strawberry Hills or one of the campgrounds down the there. Campgrounds, yeah. First time yeah. Yep. yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah, Dave, you were start. also born with, a, with the pipes and that helped too, in it, addition to the talent. I got very lucky. Um, right. uh, and, and I, uh, it almost, I almost got derailed in high school. Um, they had what they call the announcers and engineers club at the North Tree Academy. Uh, you read the morning PA announcements. I couldn't get in the club. The uh, director of the club said I didn't have any talent. Huh. And it destroyed me ego wise. And then later it's like, you know, I'm going to beat, I'm going to, I'm going to beat the odds or what I thought were the odds. Then I'm really going to try even harder. Never got to the announcers and engineers club, but several years later, the same gentleman was the guy who did the uh, the high school football games on the air. And lo and behold, one game, uh, he just couldn't get on the air that day. Uh, so revenge was kind of sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jack McCaddy. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, mean, it was, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure it could have been rectified. But it didn't get rectified. So we didn't do the game. He didn't get on the air. Listen, I couldn't get on for four years. One game I didn't think was a you no. Know, Huge cost, but yeah. yeah, that was that was the most evil thing I think I've ever done uh, as far as yeah, on air stuff. <laughs> Tracy, how did you how did you get into the whole thing of collecting uh, all of the jingles and all that? Were you like a radio groupie, or what was it that made you want to start this crazy thing that's become so successful for you? Called insanity, if you will. Uh, I started listening to the radio as a seven year old back in about April '68. I have uh, three older brothers. And my brother and uh, Pete can play dueling pianos because my brother can hear a song and sit down and play it like he wrote it. Uh, you know, just has that talent, speaks three languages, doesn't know to put his socks on when it's raining outside, but everything else he does pretty well. <laughs> and I started listening and paying attention. I mean, uh, the station up here, uh, WHYN, uh, which is, you know, my blowtorch that I listened to, like some people did DRC, was uh, airing. Uh, Trella Hart doing jingles and other stuff. I just kind of got interested and end up involved with uh, somebody at one of the other radio stations and copying reels. And again, I've been uh, doing that. I mean, it's, it's funny. Um, Mark Jones just left here this morning to go back to the UK. And he literally set up in front of two tape machines in my basement for the last two weeks, transferred all of Lee Gordon's tapes, transferred. Uh, I had these reels that I dubbed in the production studios at WHYN in 1975. Uh, which had a little flood in the basement. He was sitting there vacuuming the mold off of them and, and cleaning them up and uh, probably transferred two or 300 reels 
uh, not to mention a, a crap load of dats. We just killed the last of the dat machines around here. I've probably gone oh, through no. 15 of them. And then oh, and I've still got another uh, uh, couple of thousand to transfer. And so long and short, you asked me the time I'm building you a watch, but uh, I was hanging around the radio stations. I, I always say my talent is that I've done one air shift on every Springfield area radio station, <laughs> and usually just one. Uh, and now as uh, Pete's aware, and you guys also will, uh, we're running an LPFM playing the uh, lighter side of Springfield and mm -hmm. um, sounds pretty Damn decent, thanks for the help of Pete. And yeah, but it, it, programming wise and music wise, it could be a fifty thousand watt station. It could be, and you know, it sounds better than the fifty thousand watt stations. Yeah, I know does. I'm biased saying that, um, and you know, my forte, uh, admittedly, is jingles uh, or what they want to pass off as jingles these days. You know, to use a John Wolford is and more drums <laughs> and call letters. It's not even drums and call letters. It's screaming voices. <laughs> And, you know, uh, we're programming it. Uh, obviously, it's commercial free, uh, an LPFM. And it sounds freaking awesome. I mean, I'm not a fan of air supply and barely man enough, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it fits his niche in the audience. Uh, we had somebody bitch on Facebook that we played an Adele song the other day, and it's too new. You shouldn't be playing an Adele <laughs> song. So, you know, if everybody's going to have their... Uh, their forte on it so that's how i got into it you know again i did part-time board hopping more than anything else uh, through high school and some college and uh, i've never been an on-air talent like i said i've done one air shift one oldie shift at hyn one more shift on what's now rock 102 up here um keeps my feet you know my toes in the water and uh yeah i've always had a face for radio so it's perfect and we got uh, and uh, now, John. I don't know, John. Before you became a, a board op at DRC, how did you walk into that world? Uh, pure luck. <laughs> I I started off at uh, WLKN in in Stinkin Lincoln, Maine. It was a one thousand watt station, uh, and I always enjoyed being more of a board op and the pusher of buttons and turning dials and being a a person that you know uses their voice to to convey a message uh i i started off in college radio at uh, waic and i was sort of like a board op there i you know i spoke a little bit but i would enjoy doing things segues and going into commercials and and doing that type of a thing uh then i uh got the bug i guess uh earlier than that i always wanted to be a television camera operator that sounds stupid but i mean i used to watch the olympics uh and they you know it was obviously na national television then and all of the camera operators that were there that I said, gee, I would love to be there, you know, taking pictures of this and taking doing videos of that. Then I found out that uh, only the the top one percent of all of the camera operators of the world actually gets to to do that because I uh, they uh, take the best of the the networks to to do to cover that uh, venue. Um, then. I left DRC, uh, TIC, I mean, uh, uh, WLKN, and uh, I wanted to be a, a first-class operator, so I went to Elkins Institute. I got out of Elkins Institute, and I ran into Wayne Mulligan, who was setting up for uh, a remote. And uh, we, we talked a little bit, and, and I said... Uh, I don't know that much about uh, the radio business. I've only been in it like uh, six, eight months. He said, uh, well, if you, you'd like to, to join us, uh, we're, we're looking for a, a board op. So like, that's how I started. And that was it. And the rest is history. And the rest is history. Well, I then I went from there to RCHRCQ and WTXL uh, Channel 20. Uh, I mean, uh, WATR. I keep on saying TXL because uh, I used to listen to WTXL uh, <laughs> in, Spring, in West Springfield. Yeah. 
I don't know, Tracy, have you ever been, have you been to uh, TXL? I was back there when Westy was there and uh, a lot of the other people back in the, uh, Rustabella was there back for a while too. Speaking yeah, of Carney people. worked there, I think a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I think everybody's that's where he there. met Westy. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's now uh, playing Spanish music and they're still in their old studios in West Springfield. Uh, like a, like a little bunker over there. Talk about uh, a really low class operation back then. Really? I, I remember, I can remember going there and taking a look at the transmitter and they had a gar, uh, uh, a ground going out to uh, the towers and there was a strip of copper and there was a gap in the copper to another strip of copper which was about six eight inches wide <laughs> and they had like a 22 gauge wire with uh, alligator clips connecting the two together and I don't know how it was just <laughs> From a technical standpoint, it really was, uh, you know, uh, what would you call it? Uh, a toilet. At 1490, at 1490 on the dial. I mean, you know, it was uh, way up there. You know, you're trying to compete against HYN at 5,000 watts at 560, you know? Well, we had um, Pete Salant, you started this whole thing. So before we wind up, Pete, you've, uh, you've been over some tr tremendous stations, but what was it with you that got you uh, first into it? Um, my my dad and my mom and dad were friends with um, a couple who the guy was an engineer at WNEW in New York. And um, my dad said, hey, how'd you like to take a tour? Irv would like to give us a tour. So I was eight years old and I got the tour of NEW which was a major union shop, engineers, uh, you know, jocks, the whole the whole thing. And from that moment on, that's all I wanted to do. My uh, my dad had some connections and got got us got me a couple of turntables that you can queue up and and stuff. And he helped. He knew some engineering. He helped me build a mixer. And uh, I had a station in, in my bedroom. It didn't go anywhere except to a tape deck. But uh but that was that. And then I, when I was a junior in high school, I got a, a job at uh, what was a New York station. It was it ended up being 97 WWDJ, but it was a country station at the time, WJRZ. This was in 1970. And I wrote commercials. I wasn't allowed on the air or to touch anything because it was union. But uh, that was that was my my first actual job. And then uh i went to college for two semesters and uh after that it was uh working my way up in the traditional way yeah that's you know, speaking about uh, the big time radio in uh new york city i my first job at uh uh in lincoln frank Daly was uh the owner of the radio station i think he worked at wabc before that and he used to tell a story about how the union used to uh, tantalize the on-air personalities. They would, were not, like you said, they weren't allowed to touch the microphones. <laughs> and they were going to go into a station break. And so one of the engineers got up on a ladder, a step ladder, and put the microphone on the top of the ladder. And the person that had to do the announcing had to climb up the ladder to, to do the break couldn't touch the microphone or anything. <laughs> All right. Well, well, guys, I got to tell you, you know, uh, we're going to wrap it up right here. But again, as I always say, hang around free and easy. That's when, you know, it's you never know what's going to happen then. But uh, I'm going to make Dave's life a little bit easier. So uh, just want to thank you for joining us for another edition of Radio Friends again for April 12th. And But this is a perfect example for those who have a chance to listen to the Zoom to remember what it was that brought you into this business that you love so much. And as I always say, the business never leaves you. So thank you for uh, always uh, get so many comments after the show, guys that like to listen in. And for whatever reason, you know, they uh, they like to catch it whenever they can. So uh, I want to thank you for listening and uh, thank you guys as always. Uh, we've been doing this for a while now and uh, I know it does a lot for me. So thanks a lot. But it also shows people that have never been in this business 
it's fraught full of rejection <laughs> and it's it's just you have to just you have to love it so much yourself that if even if nobody listens you still enjoy talking to yourself in your bedroom into your reel to reel and we know that pete still gets some time to do that from time to time as long as you can say keep it in your bedroom pete we're safe all right oh, <laughs> we'll catch you on the next edition of radio friends again i'm steve parker i'm out of here bye thanks steve you're a friend you're a friend has got a lot to share